on a beautiful day, sunny day, with the fall leaves changing or what were you on the river, it's just spectacularly beautiful. But then you have the days when it's snowing, raining, and you're out there um, rowing away. It's, it's uh, freezing. It's just the most beautiful sport and very demanding sport. So, you know, if, if adversity um, makes for character, I think this is a sport that, that really uh, uh, teaches that. To me, this is a sport that takes you beyond what you think you can do. And I think that in the end, this is really the story of not only crew, but of this school. That we take these kids, all very talented, and we make them realize that they can go well beyond what they think they can do. And to me, uh, this has been so much what this school has done for me and given me the, the life that I had, I've had. At the time, my parents were in Boston for my brother's wedding, and they heard, you know, bad things, and so they sent word to get the two of us out of Shanghai. And so one, at the crack of dawn, um, one morning, we were spirited out of Shanghai. Virtually everything was left behind. Things were in such chaos that there was no time or perhaps knowledge about where I should go. I spoke no English and there were no Chinese around. I mean, St. Johnsbury, I don't think they'd ever seen any Chinese before. And so I had to learn English. I remember the first few days in school and I sat behind this girl and I would pull on her hair and she would turn around and try to explain something to me. I knew that China was gone. So the realization that there's nothing to go back to, I think made the uh, need to prepare myself, if you will, all important. I think there's nothing like hunger, if you will, to, to uh, motivate somebody. And once I saw the school, I was just dazzled by what it had to offer. And the idea that I could come here was just opened up my imagination. So my first year here was as a lower, uh, it was really a struggle. By then my English was much better because of the two years at, at rectory, but I was still, you know, relatively weak. I was driven by the sense that I was behind and that I needed to catch up. So that was the struggle. Because the standards had been set so high, relative to what I thought I could do, that when I realized I could actually do it, it built a sense of confidence in me. And I realized that if I could deal with the challenges that had been put before me at Andover, that if I could make it at Andover, I think I had this sense that I could make it um, going forward. When I came here, I was not really skilled in any particular sport, so I tried everything. And a uh, little bit of soccer, a little bit of swimming, some wrestling. In my upper year, Andover started crew for the first time. And 
this was a new sport, and I said, well, what the heck, you know, uh, nobody else has done this either, so maybe I have a chance. So I went off a crew, and I grew to love the sport. Frankie and I met at a party in New York when we were both students here. She was uh, in, in uh, 10th grade and I was in 11th grade. And so you sign up, and I think the thing was literally an hour. So you walk down here, and it took place in this very parlor here in, in, um, in uh, Draper. And so you get to talk for an hour, but at the same time, there was a chaperone. There was an occasional, I think maybe once a term, there would be a tea dance. And that was a little bit more intimate because you could actually dance together. And then once a year, I think there was a prom. Andover was more liberal, but Abbott had these rules. They, you know, one of the activities was actually to walk. Uh, in addition to different ath athletics, was they would take long walks. And half the walks went through the Andover campus but they were specifically prohibited from talking to Andover boys as they walked by uh, through the Andover campus. She just loved the place. She felt the warmth here and the friendship with some of the classmates that really was with her for the rest of her life. I think, as you know, uh, a lot of Asians and a lot of Chinese uh, have this very strong belief that education is, is, is very fundamental in terms of, of uh, providing uh, the basis for you know, transforming one's life and so forth. And that certainly runs very deeply in my family. Uh, also, however, I think you know America is really unique in terms of its belief in, in uh, or its practice of what I call institutional philanthropy. The idea that someone who has the wherewithal has some obligation to return on a voluntary basis some meaningful portion, if you will, of their uh, resources to the community. When my wife died, I realized that the time was now, that I couldn't put it off any longer. I think non sibi comes in various forms. There are those who devote their whole life to serving others. And that is a, a level of commitment, uh, you know, of which I'm in great admiration. But I am not one of those. I'm a capitalist. I believe that capitalism is a form of development that can push a society ahead. I've always believed that whatever I created, a piece of it belongs back to be reinvested back in the society, if you will. And a piece of it, by correlation, belongs to Andover because Andover is what invested in me and most certainly invested in my wife because she was a full, full scholarship student here. Providing scholarship for education for kids in need 
financial need has always been, I think, very strong sense of obligation in my family to begin with. And then given Andover's constitution, that Andover shall be ever open to youth of, I forget, requisite talent or something like that, youth from every quarter. Um, and so this has always been a, a very um, important initiative for me. As a general area, I would say this is my first area of, of philanthropy for the school. We are a very privileged institution, and we can only justify that privilege if we make it available on a, as egalitarian a basis as possible. That without that access, I don't think we can justify uh, our privilege, if you will. So the privilege comes with an obligation. So that's one way to look at it. But the other way is that it's amazing how much better a place this has become because of the uh, access. People want to be at a place like this. So it's almost a virtuous circle, if you will. You do this because it's the right thing to do. But because you do the right thing, it's a place where the best, the most talented want to be. What you dream about in a race that you should be able to pull out so far in advance that you have more than one boat length of lead on, on your competition and that you actually have what we call open water. In some ways, I think we have achieved that at Andover. So the metaphor I used is that, so now we need to find other guideposts that it's not about um, our peer schools, if you will, compare ourselves to peer schools, but rather it's, it's, we need to find other goals that are uniquely our own. I think that what's happened in the last eight years is that we've moved this place much closer to what it's always aspired to be. But the other side is that there's so much more. We have such strengths here, such talent, such academic excellence, uh, that we can go much further. We have to lay the groundwork to be able to do that in a much broader and more scalable fashion, if you will. So that's my aspiration for my successors, if you will. <laughs>